Amen. Thank you. That was wonderful. What a great uh, end of our Pentecost Sunday. Uplifting, beautiful. Our uh, scripture reading this morning it does come from the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. And the scripture reads, On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture says, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit, which the believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. May God had his blessing reading of this word. Well, it is great to be back here this Sunday, and it is wonderful to be back here on Pentecost Sunday, always an uplifting Sunday. We did, my family and I, have a wonderful time in Chicago, a great trip. It was a real tourist trip. We did all the tourist things. We walked down the Navy Pier. We saw the art in the art galleries. We went up to the top of the Sears Tower, and uh, we did one other thing that was on my list, and I think on a lot of people's list when they go to Chicago, uh, we went and had an authentic Chicago deep dish pizza. And it was good. It was, it was worth going. It was worth going and getting that. I did learn a couple of things about deep dish pizzas in Chicago. I learned that uh, they're so thick that they take 45 minutes to prepare. 45 minutes, I'm not used to that. I'm used to my pizza 10, 15 minutes. But 45 minutes to get them all cooked all the way through. So if you're going to Chicago, you get a deep dish pizza, and you're hungry, when you get there, get an appetizer. No thank you. Another thing that I learned, and I, I may have known this at some point, but I have certainly forgotten it, is the way that they manage to stack the ingredients so high is they put them in a different order. They have the crust, and then they put a bunch of cheese in the toppings, and then they put the sauce on top. And they can put more sauce since it's on top of the pizza. So the sauce then kind of becomes the featured player of the pizza, not like our normal pizza stuck between the crust and the cheese. You really see it, you really taste it, there's lots of it. Uh, it, is the, it is featured uh, on the pizza. It better be good because you're going to taste it. Well, here today, as we gather on this Pentecost Sunday, we come needing to be reminded, needing to keep in our heads that God works in this world, God exists in this world as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit. And here on Pentecost is a chance for us to think about, to consider God's Spirit. For it is often neglected. It's not always feature. I think we do talk more about the Father and the Son than we do about the Spirit, at least here in this church. That's not true in every church. And that's too bad we don't talk more about it because it does offer us so much. God's Spirit at work in our life, this person of God existing here among us and within us, gives us and offers us so much, and so we do take time here during this Pentecost Sunday to consider, consider all the ways that, that God works in our life through God's Spirit. Well, we begin by recognizing and once again remembering that God is at work, and has been always at work in this world as a Father, as a Son, and as the Holy Spirit. We, of course, call this the Trinity. And the idea of the Trinity, this concept of God that we have been given, we actually see reminders of it all around us today. You can see it on the vestments here hanging from the pulpit. You can see it on the stonework, uh, the trefoils, and the triangles. All reminders of this important knowledge that we have about God. God existing as not three things, but as three persons. Now, there's a lot we can talk about here. Certainly, the uh, idea and concept of the Holy uh, of the Trinity is something that there is. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge there, and a lot of information, a lot of mystery as well that we can try to untangle. But instead, today, I want you to focus on this idea: the Trinity, the Trinity, and this 
knowledge we have about God should excite us. Just this. This knowledge of God existing as Father, Son, and Spirit should excite us, should inspire us, and should warm our hearts. And here is why. This is not something that we figured out. This is not something that we human beings made up. This is a part of God that God revealed to us. A part of himself that God let us know about. You see, God wants to be in relationship with us. He knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And God says, I want to be in relationship with you. And so I want to let you know about myself. I want to reveal things about myself to you. And that way, you can know me better. And you can decide whether or not you want to be in relation to me. And that's such a wonderful, exciting revelation right there. Right at the beginning, God wants us to know him. God is willing to risk our rejection by telling us about himself, telling us how he works, telling us how he exists here in this world. He is revealing himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. He's been doing it for a long, long time. In our scripture reading today, Jesus is talking about this, talking about this idea. The Son of God is teaching us about the Spirit of God, this other person of God. That should warm our hearts today. And it's important for us. Because if we do want to be in relationship with God, any relationship requires revelation. We have to be able and be willing to reveal things about ourselves. If we close ourselves off from others, we will never be in a relationship with them. And so God has, from the very beginning, revealed himself to us. Taught us about who he is. He did this in creation. The act of creation is also an act of revelation. Because if you want to know somebody, look at what they create in this world. Look at what they bring into existence. We can learn so much about individuals by their creation. And so we can look at creation and we can learn about God. It's true of uh, the artwork that I saw this last week. You can look at the artwork, you can see a painting, and you can tell something about the artist by the painting. It's true of a sermon. You hear a sermon, and hopefully, yes, you learn something about God, and maybe even learn something about yourself, but you certainly will learn something about the preacher as well. I've noticed this. You can bet that if your preacher that you're listening to lives in a mansion and flies in a personal jet and has his own driver, that will be reflected in the sermon. You will hear that in the sermon. You will come to know something about him or her, and you will learn that thing through what they are saying. The act of creation is an act of revelation. We reveal things about ourselves when we create things. And so it is with God. The beauty of God's creation. The diversity of God's creation. The endurance of God's creation. All of these things teach us something about God. So just simply in the act of creating this world, creating us, God reveals and has revealed something about himself. It goes on, because creation is still going on in this world and in our lives, but that wasn't enough. God told us a lot about himself through creation, but that wasn't enough. He wanted to reveal more to us. And so he gave us the covenant. His covenant with Abraham, and we learn about him through that covenant. He gave the laws to Moses, and we learn more about him through those laws that he gave. He created a nation through King David, and we learn more about him through that act as well. But of course, his greatest act of, of revelation was his son, Jesus Christ. For three years, this ministry of Christ went on, and we read about it there in the Gospels, and we learn so much about God, so much about what God wants for this world through how Christ behaved and what he did, what his priorities were, challenging the powers that be, caring and including those who are on the outside, healing those who are sick, feeding those 
and we're hungry. In the three years of ministry, Christ revealed so much about God. And that's why we read these Gospels over and over to learn as much as we can about what Christ taught us about God and about what God wants for this world, what God wants for all of us today. And in doing this, in this act of revelation that we read about in the Bible from the first page to the last, God risks being hurt, being stung at least, or at least he risks rejection. And, and it's harder, the more you know about somebody, and the more we're able to reveal about ourselves, the more we risk that. The harder rejection becomes, the more difficult it is for us. It's true in our lives. We may meet somebody that we hit it off with initially, and we, we want to get to know them better, and, you know, they're busy, or they have enough friends, or, or something about us they're not quite that interested in, and so, no, they're, they're not that interested in, and you know, they make it clear, they don't want to quite be friends with us, and yes, that stings a little, but it doesn't hurt too bad, but when somebody who knows us, who knows us deeply, rejects us, that's devastating. That's absolutely devastating. That is what God is willing to risk. As he reveals himself, as he tells us all these things that could possibly be put into words about himself, he is risking our rejection. Just as we do in relationship, weird relationship with one another. But now, you know, this revelation, it could seem like it's sort of petering out, right? I, I mean, we had the Old Testament, we had the prophets and the covenant and the laws. Son of God came. He was here for three years. He was killed by us, but he was resurrected, which is great, which is wonderful. But now he's gone. He is with his Father. Jesus Christ is not here with us. And we are in an in-between time as we wait for his return. So we're, he has been here. He's coming back. And we're waiting. And it's easy for us to think the revelation is kind of over. You know, they finish writing the Bible. They put the last sentence down. They put the period at the end. And that's the end of Revelation. We're done with that. We've learned as much about God as we are, can possibly learn. No more to reveal. No more to know. What you can do is you can read the Bible from front to back. Then when you get done, you read it again, and you can learn some things, you pick up some things you missed, and then you read it again, and that's it. That's all the revelation there is, and it's easy for us to believe that, that the time of revelation is over. The time of growing in our relationship with God has come to an end. But here's the good news. The time of learning more about God is not over. It continues, and it continues through God's Spirit. You see, there's more to know about God than what's in the Bible. There's more to know. There is more God wants us to know about Him than is in the Bible. And so God does continue to reveal Himself to us through the Holy Spirit. It's available to each of us, this revelation. And here is the thing about it. It is very specific to each of us. It is very individual for each person. Extremely personal, absolutely individual. And it's the Holy Spirit that makes this continuing, growing relationship and revelation possible. When Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit in our scripture reading today, he is talking about it in very personal terms. He says the Holy Spirit is going to be within believers. It's in our hearts. He is in our hearts. The person of the Holy Spirit is in our hearts. And what does it do? What does he do? Flows out of us. Fills us up. Overflows and goes out into the world. This is a personal experience with God. The experience of having the Holy Spirit in our hearts. It's so important we have, and Christ gave us, this ritual of baptism. It is the moment when we take a step toward God, and God then takes this step toward us. We receive the Holy Spirit into our hearts. It's through the Holy Spirit our relationship with God gets 
personal. It gets individual. It is special. It is tailored for each and every one of us. It's like this. If all we do is read the Bible and then close the Bible, we've read it all, maybe we've read it all 10 times, 20 times, and we close it, and that's it. If that's where it comes to an end, well, then we're not knowing God fully, as fully as we certainly can in this world. It's like uh, I can study, or you can study, get all the books about Abraham Lincoln, or Winston Churchill, or Teddy Roosevelt, you can get all those books. You can learn more facts about their life than they even had at their disposal, or they had in their mind. You can get those all in your mind. You can know everything about Teddy Roosevelt there is to know. You can be an expert. But that doesn't mean you're in a relationship with Teddy Roosevelt. You're absolutely not in a relationship with him. You know about him, but you aren't in a relationship with him. Through the Holy Spirit in our hearts, we are in an intimate relationship with God. And we can learn more about God through this relationship. More than is there in the Bible. More, let's say, than can be put into words that any person can write down, can verbalize, can, can make understandable to other people. We learn things that what we feel. We feel in our hearts. We learn uh, what God has to offer us. But God has to give us gifts that he's holding, he's waiting for us to take. Gifts like a, a sense of peace. A sense of peace when our lives are in trouble. Or when we see trouble ahead. A sense of courage when we are afraid. A sense of calm when we're out of control. The more we seek out and receive these gifts of the Spirit, the more we learn about God and the closer we become to Him. These gifts that He has to give us. Calming. Peaceful. Those are gifts of the Spirit. But that's not all the Spirit gives. In fact, that's not principally what the Spirit is known for giving. Uh, we look at the story of the course of Pentecost. And what happened? Uh, the Spirit came into the church, and He set the church, and He set those individuals on fire. And that's the other thing the Spirit offers us. That's the other way we get to know more about ourselves and more about God and the Spirit's presence in our hearts. It gets us up. It gets us going. It kindles the fire within us. It gets us passionate about some need that exists in our lives or exists in our family or in our church or in our world. The Spirit gets us going. The Spirit shows us what gifts we have been given in order to be a blessing to others, in order to make this world more the place that God would have it be. See, we're learning about what God has to offer us, peace and courage, but we're also learning what we have to offer God what we have to offer those around us, the way we can be a blessing to others. God kindles this fire within us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gets us up and gets us going uh, as individuals. Let's just stay there for now. As individuals. And they rose up as individuals and as a church, they rose up, those disciples did, when they received this fire of the Holy Spirit, this mighty wind that came rushing in, what did they do? The first thing they did, they got out of there. They went out into the world. As I was saying, all speaking different languages. Language no longer a barrier uh, with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to be in relationship, uh, be in church, even if we don't speak the same language. And for that I say, praise be to God. You learn, to, you learn what your gifts are, certainly. And you learn what God wants you to do, what God's calling you to do. By examining your gifts is one great way to do that. See what you're good at and do those things. Make that difference. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of being able to do it together. We don't have to go out there on our own. We can go out there hand in hand into this world 
And we can do great things, not just by ourselves, not just being inspired in some uh, lonely walk in the woods or some uh, backyard uh, porch sitting and drinking coffee. We can be inspired here together. We can be inspired as we go out into this community to fire within us. You know, through the teachings of Jesus Christ, actually through all of the revelation that's in the Bible, but especially through the teachings of Jesus Christ, we learn what God wants for all of us. We learn what God wants for the whole world. We learn what God wants for, for every person. Uh, these are not uh, specific teachings of them necessarily. They're general teachings. They're for everyone. But the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit teaches us what God wants for us. And what God has in store for us. What God hopes for us. Through the Holy Spirit, you learn what God wants for you. You learn what it is to be in relationship with God. You learn that your relationship with God is absolutely your own. For no one else to judge, it is your. It is special. It is unique. And so, it is your responsibility to nurture that relationship. I can't do it for you, your elders can't do it for you, the choir can't do it for you. You have to do it yourself to nurture this relationship. And one way you do that is you do not just invite the Holy Spirit into your life one time at your baptism. You invite the Holy Spirit to be at work in your life over and over again. Once again, do not invite the Holy Spirit to be at work in your life just one time. You must invite the Holy Spirit to be at work over and over again. I often talk about things that we can do in the morning to get us off to a good start. You know, your feet hit the, hit the floor of the bedroom, getting out of bed. What can you do? And of course, one of my favorites is to say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is an act of praise to begin the day. I have also suggested that you think of three things right off the bat that you are thankful for, because this gets you and puts you in a thankful frame of mind. So let me add a third to that. We're on the theme of three today, so here's a third thing you can do. You praise God, you give thanks, and you get yourself in a thankful mood, and then you do what we do here every Sunday in our worship service. You do a personal invocation. That is the prayer where we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. And so you say a prayer, inviting the Holy Spirit to be with you throughout the day, helping you to see those opportunities for ministry, for service, to be a blessing to others, helping you to see those gifts that maybe that you have neglected and to inspire you to do God's work in this world, to bring joy into this world. This is truly good news to hear on this Pentecost Sunday. God loves us so much, he is willing to risk rejection by revealing himself to us through the covenant, through the laws, through the prophets, and through his son, Jesus Christ. And that revelation does not end when we close our Bible, when we are done reading and we are done studying, that revelation keeps on going through God's spirit. As you know, and as you see here today, we do have two symbols uh, for the Holy Spirit. One is here on this vestment. Over here is the symbol of the dove, the peaceful dove. And the other symbol of the Holy Spirit that we use in the church is the burning flame. The holy dove and the burning flame. Okay, well, as you go forward in this week, I want you to remember these two images. It's going to remind you of this message today. You carry these images of the burning flame, the peaceful dove here so that you can remember the one who lives here. The Holy Spirit. Offering you peace. Offering the chance to set you a fire. Giving you the opportunity to know God better, to be in closer relationship 
with God, understanding God's will for you and understanding the gifts he has given you to be a blessing in this world. Let us bow in prayer. Loving God, thank you for giving us the gift of your presence in our lives and in our hearts. Help us to sense the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives each day. May your Spirit inspire us to do great things to the glory of your name. It is in your Son's name we pray now. Amen. If you are looking for a church home today, if you'd like to come and join us by transfer of membership, by confession of faith, I would invite you to come forward during the singing now of our hymn of invitation and join.